Awesome. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Hannah Welsh and I am one of the course directors for our flagship course at Terra.do called Climate Change Learning for Action. Hello to our fellows and alumni from Learning for Action and a big welcome to anyone joining from the public from outside the Terra.do community. We hope that you'll go check us out on our website, Terra.do, and now is the perfect time to apply for our next cohort of Learning for Action, which launches in mid-March. This event that you've joined today is part of the slate of guest talks for the course, so hopefully it will give you a taste of what you can expect if you sign up. And without further ado, an especially warm welcome to our guest speaker for today, Jamie Alexander. Jamie Beck Alexander is a solutions-oriented corporate climate advocate, coalition builder, and the founding director of Drawdown Labs. Jamie joined the Project Drawdown team from Ceres, where she led corporate engagement on the West Coast, working with companies to set ambitious emission reduction targets and leveraging their influence in support of strong climate and clean energy policies. Today, Jamie will discuss climate solutions at work, a report that was recently published by Drawdown Labs that serves as a how-to guide for employees looking to engage in climate action. We're thrilled to have Jamie here to chat with us today. Just a couple um, items of housekeeping. Uh, looks like you all are doing great at this so far, just normal um, Zoom courtesy to keep yourself on mute while the presentation is happening. Um, the Q&A for this session will be reserved for current fellows in the Learning for Action course unless we run out of questions, in which case we will open it up to the public to ask questions in the chat. But for the time being, please do refrain from posting questions in the chat. Although there will be a section of the presentation where Jamie will be soliciting some uh, input from everyone and you, everyone is welcome to post at that time. And if you are a fellow in the course, um, you can find the link to the Slido that we use for Q&A in Liam's post on Slack. Okay, I think that's it. With that, over to you, Jamie. Awesome. Thank you so much, Hannah. Um, thanks for having me today. Um, I have to say, I feel like I'm among family because Terra.do is just one of my favorite organizations. I think, you know, what the community that you all are building is, is exactly what the world needs. Um, so it's an honor to be with all of you, especially to talk about my very favorite topic, making every job a climate job. Um, so I really think that's where the movement needs to be right now. All of us, you know, finding our inroads from wherever we are and whatever we do for a living. Um, but it hasn't always been like this. Uh, climate work hasn't always necessarily been the easiest to access um, or to break into. Um, and I say that from personal experience. Um, so I wanted to start today with a quick kind of um, reflection on where I think we started as a climate movement so that we can appreciate um, how far we have come. So I'm going to show this image, which I think to me connotes sort of where we began as a climate movement. And you're going to see a lot of nature imagery from me today. So just bear with me. Um, so in my observation, I think the, the climate movement began, especially within businesses, um, as being kind of super constrained and, and limited and narrow. So who is part of climate work? Who's sort of part of this work stream and who's kind of watching from the sidelines? Who has a say in what our goals are? Who gets to work on it? What skills and expertise are like included in that, you know, in that work stream? Do you work on climate? You know, are you in this flow or are you not? Are you in the game or watching from the sidelines? And there was this kind of steep barrier to entry, almost like this stone wall that you see here. Um, and if you wanted to work on climate change, you had to compete with thousands of people for a handful of jobs. And believe me, I have been there, which is why I'm so passionate about this, this, this issue. Um, you know, you needed certain credentials, relationships. Um, and so up until very recently, it's been this sort of like orderly, super well-defined like trickle of work um, with everyone else being on the sidelines and hoping that the people who are working on it are moving quickly enough. But for such an existential, all-encompassing challenge like climate change, how is it possible that only you know, a relative few people get to work on it? 
Because, you know, what we need to do, the work that's in front of all of us is to transform, you know, everything about the way we live on this planet. And that kind of change is going to take more than a few people with sustainability in their job titles. This kind of change calls for more than, you know, an orderly gradual trickle. The kind of change that we need calls for a flood a flood of new ideas, diverse perspectives and skill sets, people from all backgrounds bringing their power and their unique selves and strengths to this challenge. That is what Terra.do is doing. And that is why I'm so, ex you know, what I'm so excited to see happening finally in the climate space, more people finding their inroads from wherever they are. Um, so how do we identify, you know, our biggest leverage points, especially in the workplace? That's what we're going to talk more about today. Um, and I think about this in kind of two broad categories. So how do, how do you make climate, your job a climate job? I think about this in two ways. So one is, you know, implementing climate solutions directly. So we'll touch on that as one, one way of making climate into your job. And the other is tapping key leverage points, um, especially at work, which is where we're going to sort of spend a little bit more of our, of our focus today. So we're going to start um, with implementing climate solutions directly, right? The solutions to the climate crisis are at our fingertips. We have the wisdom, technologies, and practices to limit warming to 1.5 C. We have the solutions to do that. And this here is a, a depiction of the solutions that Project Drawdown has analyzed and researched. Um, so we know the what, we know what we need to do. We know what the solutions to the climate crisis are. Um, and we need to scale these so rapidly that they displace entirely, you know, the, the other thing, the, 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 the things we're doing that are not compatible with a livable world. Um, so this is, you know, the bread and butter of Project Drawdown. Um, and I'm going to give a quick, quick, quick high level overview of these like broad solution areas in like the broadest terms, because we need lots of people trained and equipped and in jobs, starting new ventures, positioned to scale these climate solutions directly. Um, so I'll spin through these super quick, um, but you can also go to drawdown.org and do a much deeper dive on these and many more solutions. Okay, so super quick, a high level tour. We need to totally transform our energy system. We need people who can transform, you know, by implementing, um, by, by installing solar panels and wind turbines. We need people implementing climate solutions like regenerative agriculture, tree intercropping, silvopasture, new ways of feeding people while absorbing carbon. We need to shift our diets to more plants and less meat and much, much less food wasted. Right now about one third of the world's food is never eaten. So we need startups and farmers and cooks and all kinds of people working on, on these solutions. We need to figure out how to keep people cool as temperatures rise um, in ways that don't contribute to greenhouse gas pollution. We need to address building efficiency, green roofs, how we power our building more efficiently. We need people employed like engineers, construction workers, designers. We need to remake our cities so that they're more equitable and walkable and bikeable and so that they connect people without having to get in a personally owned vehicle. Um, and yes, we need to electrify the cars that are already on the road. Um, we need to transform our relationship with nature because we need to exist together with instead of at odds with nature. Right now, nature in the ocean and on land absorbs about 30% of the emissions that we humans put into the atmosphere every year. So that makes nature really, really important. Um, so we're gonna need all kinds of people helping us you know, protect and restore these important ecosystems. We need to ensure that people have access to equitable reproductive health care and high quality education. These are fundamental human rights and they have cascading benefits to the climate. That'll take teachers and healthcare workers and many more. Um, so that was our super, super quick whirlwind tour of the highest kind of order of, uh, of categorization that we at Project Drawdown um, think about when we, when we think about um, climate solutions. So we need people in jobs to implement those climate solutions oops, um, quickly, safely, and equitably, full stop. And again, you can go to drawdown.org for more on those solutions. But I do want to pause here briefly to see if anyone wants to just type in the chat, 
ways that they are implementing climate solutions as part of their job. So feel free to, to um, paste anything in the chat that you would like to about work that you're doing to implement climate solutions, and then we'll move on. And we'll just let those continue to, uh, to come in and just thank you for the work that you're doing to scale climate solutions in the world. We need a lot more of that. There's so much demand for climate solutions, so much um, work is needed here. So thank you for your work. Um, and you can continue to paste those in while I continue on. Um, so implementing climate solutions directly is that first bubble. That's what we just walked through. We need people, um, in jobs, implementing climate solutions, installing solar panels, restoring our forests, supporting the land rights of indigenous peoples, um, trans, you know, building electric vehicles. And we need to deploy those so completely that they displace our business as usual systems. But it's not the only way of contributing. We also need to tap key leverage points that we have at our disposal, especially at work. So this is that second bubble that we're gonna um, focus for the rest of this, um, this hour. So we need to not only scale climate solutions in the world, we also need to create the conditions for these climate solutions to scale. Um, so these are what we call accelerators at Project Drawdown. These are ways of reducing barriers and accelerating the adoption of climate solutions. So these are things like shaping culture. This is storytelling, the arts, visioning, you know, painting a picture of like, what is possible? What, are we, what is the world that we're trying to move toward? We need storytellers and artists and visionaries building and you know, shaping culture to help us move toward the world that we need. We need to build power. You know, to, to date, too much power has been on the side of entrenched interests and fossil fuel lobby. And we need to build power toward you know, scaling climate solutions. We need to set better goals. Um, you know, net zero by 2050 is not a, you know, an adequate goal to be shooting for when everything we know and love is on the line. So we need to set more and more expansive goals, altering rules and policy, um, shifting capital. So getting money to, you know, to the deployment of climate solutions, changing behavior. Just about every climate solution has a behavioral dimension. And when aggregated, individual behavior change can, you know, affect bigger systems. And then improving technology, you know, it, technology can help to scale all of the climate solutions that we already have faster and make them more efficient. But today we're going to focus on one of these accelerators, which is my personal favorite, and that is build power and specifically build power in the workplace to move your organization or company faster. So why take action at work? Um, well, businesses, and again, especially larger corporations, have by and large contributed the most to the climate crisis, um, and they bear disproportionate responsibility to make bigger and bolder moves. Um, companies have the resources and influence and scale to help fix it. Um, and employees are the backbone of any company. Employees matter to companies. Retention matters, recruitment matters, having the best talent inside the business matters to, to, to corporate leaders. So that's why climate aware employees are in such an exciting and powerful place right now to change things from the inside. And that was why my team at Project Drawdown recently published the guide that Hannah mentioned, um, Climate Solutions at Work. And our main, our main goal with this guide was to what we call democratize climate action. So this is really opening up climate action across the business so that everyone can contribute, you know, no matter what their job title is. Um, and in order to do that, we first wanted to identify all of the ways that companies influence the climate crisis or climate action, for better or worse. Um, and when we did that, when we embarked on this effort to look at, okay, what are all of the all of the things that companies do, what are all of the sort of tentacles that they have out in the world and the ways that they're influencing climate action. We came up with what we call the drawdown aligned business framework. And that's what you see here. So this graphic essentially shows, okay, you know, we know that businesses contribute to climate change through their emissions. That's the, the rectangle that you see on the left. 
But that's not the only thing that's going on. There's often other sides of the business that can be misaligned with or support one or the other, uh, uh, the, the company's climate goals or sustainability teams, you know, climate pledges. So today we're going to walk through this framework um, and surface some of the big ways that businesses um, influence the climate crisis or ways that they could positively influence climate action. Um, and when viewed this way, it actually brings a lot more people in from across the business to help solve the problem. Um, and as we're walking through this framework, I want to ask you to keep a few questions in mind. Um, so just kind of, you know, what resonates with you? Um, you know, how can you go about integrating these actions into your work or your team's work? Um, what decision-making power do you have or who makes the decisions for each of these things in the business and sort of like eventually being able to do like a power map of like who makes the decisions and how can I influence that person? Um, who do you work with and have relationships with? And then, oops, going back to the drawdown solutions which solutions might relate to your current role and how can you integrate more climate solutions um, into, your, into your current role. So we're gonna walk through, again, these eight kind of leverage points that every company has, every large company has at their disposal to try to figure out how more people can contribute. Um, and these graphics were done by, um, by, by our, my colleague at, at Project Drawdown, um, who's just phenomenal, phenomenal, Philippe Lazaro. So um, shout out to him for these, these graphics. Um, so starting with emissions reductions, we know that the world needs to have our, our greenhouse gas emissions every decade, 7% reduction in emissions every year. So this is an immediate need for companies to set and implement ambitious goals and measure and disclose their efforts. But most current corporate Green, corporate uh, emissions reductions goals are relatively weak. So we recommend, you know, having interim targets. That means like, you know, what are you, how, what are you going to meet uh, year over year? What, what is the progress we expect to see year over year? Um, you know, addressing full supply chain and historical emissions, um, you know, not, not relying on carbon removal technology, embedding climate justice into this work and institutionalizing emissions reductions efforts. So when you look at it that way, it, it can bring more roles in throughout the company. So historically, you know, looking at emissions reductions typically has lived with the sustainability team. It's often a huge, you know, a huge effort and a, a huge um, mandate for a relatively small and under-resourced team. So, you know, human resources professionals you know, the HR function in most businesses can be helpful in helping institutionalize emissions reductions, tying executive compensation to the achievement of, 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 of a company's climate goals. Government affairs teams can be involved. Operations, procurement, and sustainability teams can look at, you know, renewable energy and, and, and having a justice lens to look at, you know, where, where certain communities are, are, um, are most affected. Um, the second leverage point um, here is stakeholder engagement and collaboration. So businesses, you know, do not operate in a bubble. They operate in a complex ecosystem, um, employees, customers, shareholders, and communities. So when, you know, how are companies kind of bringing in and positively influencing all these actors? That, that really matters. Um, so is the, you know, is the business meaningfully engaging employees on climate action? Is the board climate competent? Um, is, the, is the business partnering with um, and supporting the local communities in which it's active? So again, human resources professionals here can help actively engage employees on climate action and fostering safe and open working environments. Um, external affairs teams can look at how the business is supporting and working with local communities. Um, and then legal teams or general counsels who work closely with, with the board can ensure um, a strong climate fluency across the board. Um, a recent survey, this just blows my mind, a recent survey found that 17% of the companies of, on the Forbes Global 2000 had board members that had any sustainability credentials. So really working on getting, you know, getting climate competent people on, you know, on corporate boards is important. Um, so the next leverage point um, available to most larger businesses is products, partnerships, and procurement. 
Um, it's always been nonsensical to me that there are these companies that produce massive amounts of stuff and then they set these emissions reductions targets as though this mass, the, the actual products that they're producing doesn't also need to be looked at. So companies need so to account for the whole scope. Yikes. Um, sorry, I'm just getting a little feedback, uh, the audio issue. Um, so companies need to account for the full scope of their climate impacts across their products, their partnerships, and their procurement processes, even if it means that they have to leave some business on the table. So that means, you know, looking at what partnerships do you have? Are you partnering, you know, in some way down the line with, with the fossil fuel industry? Um, you can require your suppliers to adopt science-based targets. You can, you know, prioritize products that are, you know, more circular in nature and use lower carbon materials. Um, so this is really encouraging, you know, a hard look at what the actual business model is of a company. Um, you can't have sustainability targets and simultaneously, you know, produce technology that helps oil companies drill more efficiently, for example. So um, when you, you know, in this, looking at this leverage point, this brings in designers who can think about, you know, designing products with lower carbon materials and with circularity in mind, data scientists and engineers for tracking the use and disposal of products and help, you know, with that circular flow, um, sustainability procurement and operations team, uh, they can, you know, develop company policies that require suppliers to adopt science-based emission reductions targets. Uh, and one example here is the, the Clean Creatives campaign that asks um, individuals in the PR and advertising industry to, you know, to reject contracts with the fossil fuel industry. So that brings in, brings in the PR and marketing teams. Um, investments and financing is a huge leverage point of most businesses. Um, we know that money holds a lot of power, much of which is currently still being funneled toward fossil fuels and other extractive industries. And this makes capital a huge catalyst in, you know, in halting emissions and financing climate solutions. So here, you know, businesses can push their banks and asset managers to reduce their financed emissions. Um, they can make climate friendly retirement plans uh, for their employees and they can make that the default um, and they can pressure insurance companies to stop underwriting um, and investing in carbon intensive products. And so the, you know, the different teams throughout a, a business that this brings in are finance teams, investor relations teams, human resource and, you know, and operations teams who can look at providing, you know, climate friendly 401ks and retirement plan options. Um, so according to Project Drawdown's assessment, annual investments in climate solutions must increase eight, eightfold uh, to match you know, the $5 trillion that, that we need to, uh, to scale climate solutions at the level we need to. Um, so this is, a, this is a, huge, a huge leverage point. Climate disclosures. So you know, dis every business needs to be disclosing their impact and their risk profile um, when it comes to climate change. And this, you know, this brings in government affairs teams, uh, finance teams, and investor teams. Um, climate policy advocacy. This is a big one right now, as um, in the U.S., you know, we've been working hard for, you know, to push companies to support um, major climate investments that are in uh, the Build Back Better Act. Um, and so climate policy advocacy is a huge and powerful leverage point available to, to really any business of any size. Um, and that is, you know, they should be advocating for climate policy at the local, state, federal level, focusing their lobbying dollars on climate solutions, aligning their political contributions for larger corporations that, you know, that, that make political contributions, ensuring those are aligned. Um, and then pushing, you know, trade associations and other membership organizations on climate action. Again, here in the U.S., we have the Chamber of Commerce and Business Roundtable groups of, you know, of, of corporate um, executives who are, you know, behind the scenes sort of obstructing um, the passing of these really important climate provisions that are that are on the table um, here in the U.S. So, you know, in my opinion, if a company is serious about their climate pledges then they'll be doing climate policy advocacy because they need pol these policies in place to be able to meet their climate targets. 
Um, so to me, a, you know, a barometer of whether a company is serious about their climate pledges is, are they, are they active um, on climate policy? Um, so again, this brings in sustainability, regional offices where state policies are relevant, government and external affairs teams, marketing, um, and then executives who can push their trade associations. Um, and then thinking longer term. So, you know, we need to move away from this incessant focus on short term profit. That is just something that needs to happen. We cannot coexist with you know, this, this incessant focus on, um, on quarterly returns and live in, you know, in, in a, in a thriving world. Um, so we're starting to see a shift in thinking around, you know, our current economic paradigm that companies need to integrate human and ecological well-being um, into their definition of success. So we're seeing, you know, things like donut economics, which advocates for everyone having their social and physical needs met while not exceeding the planetary's the, the, the planet's boundaries. Um, and long-term thinking is, you know, not just good for the planet, but also for businesses and for their, you know, revenue growth and sustained investment. So this is one where, you know, I think everyone across the business can be thinking about how they can move their company toward um, thinking more in the the longer term, but especially um, operations teams and, and leadership. And lastly, um, business model transformations. This is actually one of my favorites. Um, again, it's sort of my opinion that many companies right now have business models that are not, not really compatible with the world that we need to move to. Um, and so if companies want to exist in the era of climate change, they'll need to transform their business models to one that starts to focus on scaling climate solutions full stop. This is, you know, the auto industry and, you know, like big auto companies saying, we're going to stop producing internal combustion engines by this date, and we're going to be all EV. That's sort of what that looks like. Um, and I think that's going to have to happen across sectors in, in, in big ways um, and sort of phasing out parts of the business that just, that just don't work anymore. Um, and so this brings in, you know, innovators, strategists, designers, um, even salespeople to think about, to think about these issues. Um, and I think this is a really exciting one that we're going to see a lot on um, in, in, um, in the next, you know, in the, in the year or two ahead. So I hope that kind of walking through these big leverage points that companies have available to them sort of provides, you know, more one, I hope it provides like a, a list of a list of asks. Like if you work in a large corporation, you should want to see your company moving along, you know, moving on all of these in all of these areas. And I hope that it helps provide more, you know, ideas for more inroads across more job functions to contribute. Um, so that felt like a lot. Um, I'm going to stop here so we can have a discussion together, but I'll just end by saying, you know, we, we already know the solutions. So again, this is Project Drawdown sort of depiction of all of the solutions we have in hand. We have a good sense of the tactics that we have to scale these solutions. We know big leverage points that companies have to move faster and more boldly. So I would love to see us, you know, move away from this model where there's these walls and constraints around who works on it and who doesn't and move toward this, you know, this, this idea of a flood of new people and new voices. Um, the climate crisis doesn't fit into our, into our neatly defined boxes as much as we wish it would. Um, I don't know why this keeps moving automatically. Um, so responding to it with the same level of expansiveness is the only way forward. Um, so we need the work to happen everywhere, by everyone, at all levels. Um, and I think it's time to make every job a climate job and let's open the floodgates. So that is what I have for today. Hannah, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you so much, Jamie. That was really excellent. I am looking over at our Q&A on the Slido right now. Let's see. And just a reminder to our fellows that um, you can use that app not only to add your own questions, but to check out what other people have asked and upvote them. So we have a sense of priority of which questions to ask. There's just one so far. It's a kind of, I can um, give you an easy one to start with. Um, 
Well, actually, let's go with what are some things one can do if working at a smaller startup whose main priority is to increase revenue? Kind of you talked a lot about the larger companies. And so how would you translate that over to smaller companies and startups whose context is a bit different? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think smaller, smaller companies and startups have, you know, also they also have political clout. Companies of any size, you know, represent a number of employees in a given, you know, in a given place and represent an amount of revenue and, you know, in a, in a given state or in a given community. And so they do have clout, even, you know, no matter their size. Um, you know, I think there's also there in some ways being part of a startup or a smaller business gives you more agility, more ability to be nimble. So you can really exemplify new ways of operating, like exploring some of the you know, long-term thinking ideas, um, the business model transformation ideas, looking at giving your employees um, climate-friendly 401ks. Um, I think there's almost a benefit to being a smaller business where you can really illustrate um, without the multiple levels of, um, of bureaucracy that the larger businesses have. You can really demonstrate what it looks like to be a business in the era of climate change. Um, because there's not a whole lot of those examples right now and we need them. And I think if, if smaller businesses can exemplify that, that's, that's really powerful. Awesome, thank you. Um, how about, so how do you start influencing public companies that are doing or saying that they're doing sustainability and ESG efforts, but it seems to be purely for reporting purposes? Um, what arguments do you start with? How do you incentivize action beyond just that disclosure level? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I mean, disclosure it, and, and the reporting and all of the different things out there to report against, take, it does take a lot of time. I mean, I can see why, you know, why sustainability teams would end up spending half the year working on their, you know, their, their reporting. Um, and that is why it's so important to get out of, you know, just the this where one department is the, you know, works on this issue. We need we need employees from across the business to work on it because it's it's too much for one team, and there's too many relevant, um, you know, relevant things to work on from different from different teams. Um, again, I think I think there's there's nothing binding about a company's climate statements. So it's really hard to ascertain, are they authentic, you know, and, and can we rely on these? Can we assume that these are gonna, that they're gonna achieve this net zero by 2040 goal? Um, there's no way of knowing that. And so I think I do rely more on how are companies stepping up in other ways? Are they showing up at state, you know, at state legislatures or at the, at the federal level or at a local level? to advocate for climate policy? Um, are they enabling their employees to, you know, to have green 401ks, to have retirement plans and investments that are in alignment with these values? Like how are they proving it in other, in other parts of the business um, is where I, that's where I, and, and how are they supporting employees in, in working on it? You know, I mean, we've had examples here in the U S especially in the tech sector where, employees were interested in helping their company move faster. And instead of that being welcomed, it was seen as a threat. And so that, you know, that that's going to need to change. I think companies should welcome employees organizing and saying, we want to move faster. We want to support the company in moving faster. That should be welcomed if a company is serious about their climate goals. Um, and I think, you know, we've seen some examples of that not happening, but I think we're, we're seeing a shift now where there's strength in numbers and employees, you know, organizing, getting together and saying like, no, let's, let's really help our company move faster. That's, I think that's more welcome now than it used to be. Yeah. So important to have others on your team. <laughs> um, okay. This one's a bit different. Any advice for someone who finds themselves working in a company that isn't compatible with the decarbonization we need? So people in the fossil fuel industry or intensive farming, how to make change from within? That is such a good question. Um, so I actually used to mentor through Terra.do, someone who is in the oil and gas sector um, and who had this exact question and we really grappled with it. And it's, um, I think it's like a 
like a holy question, a holy struggle. Like what I think we do definitely need people inside those companies helping to change things from the inside. Um, so, you know, how can you, I, you know, I actually would love to have that. I would love for that person to speak about their experience sometime. Um, cause I'm not, an expert in it, but sort of walking through that, you know, that decision-making process. I mean, I think it's an individual decision. How much are you willing to, you know, be in the belly of the beast and like fight that fight day after day and, you know, try to move those mountains. Um, that's hard, that's hard work day after day. Um, but it's, it's, it's really, really, really critically important, um, for the future of, of a, a livable world. So um, I think if you have the, you know, if you're up for that and feel like you have the, you know, the energy for it, um, there's a lot to, there is a lot to do there. And, um, and I think there are, there are sort of some groups forming of people in the, in those situations who are banding together to say, okay, there's strength in numbers. What are some approaches that are working? What are the cases that we're making internally to move things faster? Um, so I would definitely recommend finding, you know, finding your people to, uh, to help keep you sustained, um, in that work. Cause that's, that's really important and really important work. Um, someone said that they're worried that focusing on corporate action and a, supp a supply based approach will be too slow and wonders how you think about this approach being enough to make a difference in the next decade. Yeah, um, that is another fantastic question. This, I definitely, I mean, I lose sleep over this question for sure. Um, you know, I think, do we, I think we simultaneously need to eval reevaluate our economic system and understand that there are, there are ma massive leverage points that, that, that companies currently have um, that we should be exploit, exploiting is a, 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 an extreme word, but using, using for climate, positive climate ends. Um, so I think that, I think we need to kind of do both. And that's why really looking at business, you know, your business model and like sort of the, the longer term thinking, we really wanted to make sure those were embedded in this in addition to all of the sort of more obvious, more obvious leverage points. Um, and I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I don't know if we're going to, you know, in this, in our current, um, and, you know, I think I really like the way this, this question was phrased. Cause I, I really don't know if we're going to be able to do it in this focus on like production and, um, and, you know, excess that, that we currently have. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I think we're all sort of navigating that together. Yeah. Um, somebody asked, if you are a new employee who is climate aware, how do you recommend navigating and building your influence? Yeah. Um, so I would say, I mean, I, I went through this at a, you know, in my, in, in, in another job. Um, I think finding your people is the most important thing to start with. Um, that could be typical, you know, kind of green teams or employee resource groups, or that could be something more like employees organizing kind of under the radar, um, whatever that looks like, kind of trying to find your people um, where it feels okay to bring all of your climate, you know, concern and passion to work. So I'd say, you know, finding your, your people first. And then um, one thing that we've started doing with some businesses is taking the framework and doing um, sort of mapping out relationships across the business and saying, okay, who's the decision maker for this one? How can we influence that decision maker? What, what does that decision maker care about? Who do they listen to? Who influences them? And how can we get to yes? Like, how can we get them to say yes to, you know, green retirement plans for employees or whatever the, whatever the thing is? Um, so doing this sort of power mapping and there are great, there are great power mapping templates out there. Um, but yeah, gathering, get, kind of getting to know who your people are and then maybe using the, that the draw down line framework or something similar as, 
as like a guide to like, okay, who do we need to reach? Who's part of this like climate ecosystem in the company? Who do we need to reach? How do we reach them? What is the message? What do they care about? And then who do we need to like get on our, you know, on our side who can like whisper in their ear and like, you know, get them to get them to make the decision that we need them to make. Um, so I feel like those are the two, two early things, you know, in, in joining a, in, you know, and being a newer employee, finding your people and then sort of like mapping out relationships. Yeah. Um, somebody asked about if there is a move to push companies to start reporting or regulating their carbon footprint in the near future and indicating that this is happening in India now. Um, I was wondering if you might just speak to, I know a little bit about carbon disclosure project in the US, but just for folks that aren't familiar, what that looks like and how um, uh, companies can build upon those efforts. Yeah, I mean, there's a few different, um, there's the task force for climate related financial disclosures tcfd is one one way that that companies provide investor grade data on their on their climate risk um, and performance um, and then there's others there's the global reporting um, index gri uh, cdp but i think that you know i think it will be eventually mandated um, federally um, i think there will be regulation around this but um, yeah, I mean, I definitely think we're that's that's for sure the direction that 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 this is going, which will help investors make better decisions about the climate risk of companies. It'll help people make better, you know, if if we're looking, you know, if, if individuals are looking at their own investments, it'll help people be able to, you know, to understand which companies have a higher, um, you know, higher carbon footprint than others. So it'll just help people be able to make like apples to apples comparisons between between companies. Um, so that's something, yeah, I, I definitely expect to see more of um, in the years ahead. Thank you. Um, you touched on this a bit before, but um, a lot of people are wondering specifically about how to work with senior leaders and board members that are resistant or just unaware um, and yeah, specifically preventing greenwashing. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, I mean, I guess I'll share a story of why I feel like this is such an important um, an important conversation to be having, and that's that um, kind of my first exposure to this was working with a group of employees at Amazon, the Amazon Employees for Climate Justice, who um, just a couple of them, a handful of them came together several years ago to say, Amazon has a lot of influence and we're not, you know, we don't have, they, at the time they didn't have any climate pledge or climate targets to speak of. Um, and so they built their numbers. They started with a handful and grew over like a few months to 7,000 employees from, the, you know, from all across the business, including warehouse workers and, you know, drivers and all like across, across Amazon came together and signed this letter basically saying, you know, they wanted, they were asking as shareholders in the company, um, you know, what we, we, we'd like to see Amazon do all the, this list of things. Um, and as shareholders, they, you know, one of them stood up and read it at an Amazon board meeting. Um, that is one, like one very, very bold and courageous um, strategy. Um, I think there are other ways that are not as, um, you know, risky, I guess that is a, a fairly risky strategy, but I think you don't have to stand up and, and read at a board meeting, but you can like sort of collect employees who want to, you know, who want to see a certain actions and, and make those known. Um, I think there's also, you know, I mean, strategies that I've seen are the, you know, at, at all, all staff meetings where a CEO, you know, is giving like their monthly or quarterly address to all employees, like, teeing up 10 employees one after another to say, what are we doing on climate? What are we doing on climate? What are we doing on climate? One after another. Um, I've seen that happen. And that has been, I'd say, fairly successful in kind of reaching um, executives with, with those concerns. Um, and then otherwise, yeah, just, I mean, figuring out those, like, those relationships and looking at, you know, doing that power mapping. How do you, who are the decision makers who has the ear of those decision makers and how can you 
How can you reach them and really figuring out what they care about? Because climate, you, there's a case to be made for every part of the business, for the CFO, for the marketing lead, for the sales lead, for the, like there, there's a climate case for every single one of those executives. Um, you just have to, you know, figure out what they, you know, what they care about and then like make that case, but it's like there for the taking, you know, climate is going to affect every single part of the business. Um, but yeah, it's not it's easier said than done for sure. Great answer. Okay, Jamie, you've equipped everyone with lots of great information and um, points to tap in, but this is, this question is, nuanced. How would you show people that they have the agency to influence things at their company? And that many people that we know don't realize that they have or don't think that they have that power. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, there are so many amazing examples. I actually see someone on this call who I won't name, but who's like doing really important work inside a company that doesn't have a sustainability team, who's just like, I'm going to do it and I'm going to take it on myself and, and build it. Um, and the person at Amazon who ended up standing up in front of Amazon's board of directors was like a UX designer. Like she, you know, I mean, I think there are so many examples. Um, and I just, I, and maybe that's something that we need more of for those people to be able to tell their, their stories that like it took, you know, what did it, what did it take? What did it look like? Um, how to, you know, and just, they're not, you know, necessarily climate like experts, but like are super committed and passionate and, you know, and brave. And, and I think telling more of those stories um, would be helpful. Cause I, I know that that's, I know that it's hard. Um, but again, like finding, finding your people and having strength in numbers is, is really important. I totally agree. I would love to see like a storytelling project on those employees on the front lines, a different sort of front line, but it'd be cool. Um, okay. Saved a kind of juicy one for the end. We're getting close to the end of time. We may be able to open it up to the public for a couple questions, but we want to hear um, from you about offsets that which we know are a contentious subject, but do continue to be one of the primary climate solutions that corporations employ to meet climate goals. So what do you see as the role of offsets in our path to decarbonization and corporate climate action? Yeah, another great question. Um, I mean, it is definitely, it's, it is a murky, murky space. Um, we, I mean, I think, I definitely recognize the need for them on a time bound basis. Um, there are, you know, some of the work of decarbonization, especially in certain sectors will take time. Um, so I understand that there's a need to, and an opportunity to, to fund, you know, nature-based climate solutions at a, on a highly, you know, um, detailed basis um, with tracking in place and accountability. Um, and at the same time, they, they, they need to be time bound. They, there needs to be like a phase down plan concurrently working on absolute reductions. So absolute reductions is the, is the goal full stop. Um, if you, you know, if a company needs to use offsets as a crutch, um, that's, uh, you know, I, I, I understand, I understand that some sectors, you know, will take longer to decarbonize. Um, but I think there is there is just a really um, problematic over-reliance on them right now. I mean, you could pay, any company could pay to be net zero tomorrow. Um, that's not honest. That's not helping anyone, especially when those like forests, like here in, you know, in, in Oregon, the, you know, one of Microsoft's main carbon offset projects went up in flames um, during our wildfire season last year. And so like, there's, that's problematic and, you know, oceans and, and, and forests only absorb so much to a point and only, and only, they only start absorbing carbon when they're at a certain level of maturity. So there's a lot of nuance there. Um, and I think our recommendation for when offsets are used are that they should focus on reducing emissions. So there are things like, you know, um, clean cook stoves that address, you know, that, that address, you know, health issues in, 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 uh, in certain countries and will help 
avoid emissions from other forms of cooking. Um, so investing in offsets that actually reduce emissions um, and nature-based solutions just need investment full stop. It shouldn't be like this quid pro quo for, you know, I'm going to keep emitting while I invest in this you know, forest, it should be like, no, we need to actually just invest in climate solutions and at the same time, reduce the emissions. Um, so that is a long winded way of saying, um, I think they're very over relied upon right now, um, but maybe a necessary crutch for a, 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 a finite period of time while we, while we focus on the real work of, of reducing emissions. I think you answered it very well. <laughs> um, so as you know, we have a global audience here at Terra. And so someone asked, how can one get involved or engage with the project drawdown work outside of the United States? For example, are there um, programs where people can train in the drawdown labs framework um, and uh, disseminate climate action in their companies or just international um, ways to involve and get engaged? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we have our um, a video series called Climate Solution or uh, Climate Solutions 101. Um, that's a, a video series that walks through um, walks through the the client client our climate solutions. That's um, sort of like a, a master class led by our executive director, and that's free and available for anyone. Um, we also do train. My team does um, does trainings for for business for employees within businesses on the specific drawdown line business framework. Um, and then otherwise, you know, all of our material is public good. So anything that we produce, we make available to the to the general public. So. Um, I can put my just my our, our email address in in the chat for anyone who wants to like get on our our newsletter. We just send out periodic updates and um, and new products that we're working on. But certainly sounds like this is a space where there's room for leadership in other countries um, as well, and lots of resources for drawdown to help with. Absolutely, it's yeah, it's very exciting. I mean, so far we've we've mostly focused on within Drawdown Labs, we've mostly focused um, on US businesses, um, but there's so much, I mean, all of, you know, all of this is relevant for, for international businesses and would love to sort of explore how that could be contextualized for different, yeah, for different, different geographical contexts and cultural contexts. We have just a few minutes left, and I am going to open it up to some questions in the chat, which might get crazy. <laughs> if you've already posted one, go ahead and post it again, because I'm going to be looking at what comes in right now. Um, but any burning questions to ask Jamie in the last couple minutes? Uh, well, I also I have one other good one. How did you end up working on this particular area of climate change, empowering employees? I think that might be helpful for folks to hear about your journey. Yeah, that is a great question. Um, so I I actually started my career working in the aid industry. Um, I worked for US the US Agency for International Development um, on health health work, which was my calling and my passion. Um, but I was living in Bangladesh doing health work there and um, just became so apparent that climate change was the, you know, a foundational issue there. And that, you know, no matter how much work we were doing on, you know, public health there, like climate change was this, was this really foundational issue. And at the same time, when I was there, uh, there was a big factory collapse where a lot of large corporations, U.S. corporations had we're manufacturing things in this in the, the the Rana Plaza factory in in Dhaka, Bangladesh. It collapsed and killed um, I don't know how many Bangladeshi people. Um, and so at the same time, as I was like having this climate realization, I was also having this like companies have this tremendous um, influence and role to play. Um, so it took me a long time to find my way in from, from making a pivot from health and international development into climate. Um, I volunteered for a while and did odd jobs and um, and then eventually, yeah, I was able to kind of parlay some of that experience into, um, into my last role at Ceres. And that's where I really got involved with some of the Amazon employees and just saw the power of of employees across, you know, across all parts of the business. And it just really convinced me that like the future of 
our economic system will be employees moving us faster, holding companies accountable. Um, to me, that that's the few, that's if if our current economic model is going to survive, it's going to be because employees are are making it so and and holding holding us all accountable to it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's lovely to hear those little tidbits of your journey and a cool connection. We actually just had our keynote speaker a couple of weeks ago was Dr. Salim Al-Hook from Bangladesh. And he spoke about his climate work in Bangladesh and the loss and damage work that um, he's been such a great activist on. So anyone from the public, that would be an awesome thing to go check out on our YouTube channel. You can see Dr. Salim Al-Hook's keynote from a few weeks ago. And like I mentioned at the beginning, we've got another cohort of Learning for Action launching in just a few weeks. So this would be the perfect time to get your application in for that. I think we are going to wrap it there, but thank you so much to Jamie for joining us and thank you to all of the fellows and the public for joining as well and asking these great questions and facilitating a rich dialogue with Jamie. We'll stay on for just another minute or two, um, but with that, cheers. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you again. Thank you so much. I'll stop the recording there. <laughs>